Welcome to another episode of the Impossible Life Podcast. I'm your co-host, Nick Surface, and I'm looking across at a man so strong that when he cuts an onion, the onion cries. That's right, friends, the former Navy SEAL. <laughs> Garen Unklebach, a man who has overcome assaults of all kinds, including those on the senses. I don't cry except for two things, and you know that. Fuck, <laughs> dude, so yeah, Garrett has these quotes. Onions don't make me cry. No, you know the only two things that make Garrett's cry? The human spirit and the Holy Spirit. And this is like, these are the kind of one-liners. <laughs> I swear he sits up I there. can't, you know, hot hot take. I can't say I'm I'm one of those guys that people are like, ah, it's okay for men to cry. I'm like, mm, pretty, <laughs> mm. <laughs> probably not do that very often. But you have these one-liners that are like so absolute that you just drop in normal conversation. I think one of the things that me and your wife both enjoy about you so much is like those little quirks because he'll just put these things in. There's only two things that make me cry. And you're like, what, is this a joke? The human spirit and the Holy Spirit. And dead serious and will just keep flowing through whatever he's saying. You're like, oh, okay, that's pretty you know, concise and very profound. Okay. Yeah, I like that. But like you're dead serious. There's, there's no, you know. know what I said. Yeah, I know what I'm about. Son. I know what I'm about. <laughs> what right. are we about today? Well, I, I'm ready to get into it. Let's do this. Garrett is raring to go, and that's because we are talking that we are kicking off a new series, which we haven't done a series in a while. Jay. I also just want to give one caveat really quick before we jump in, and then it's going to be straight business. Okay. I just want to say I am grateful for all the listeners of The Impossible Life. Yeah. I appreciate everyone who listens to this show. Um, I, w- I don't want to like, I don't mean to say this, you know, have this come across wrong. We didn't start doing this like just for you. Like, this is built up. Uh, who Nick and I are. This show has been an opportunity mm-hmm. for us to develop ourselves, for me to to learn who I am, for me to process through. Nick's helped me process through a lot of the things that I believe, a lot of what I've built my life on. But I feel like you're. I feel like the people listening to the show are like team members. Like yeah, you're you're, real. you're in this with us. When I'm not just talking at you because so many of you, I get the opportunity to to interact with, or you send us emails, and I just want to say I'm so grateful for everybody who listens to this show. And we're just getting started. Indeed, we are. Yeah, we are not going anywhere. We're three years strong and getting stronger. Um, so th- we want to kick off a new series, and the series is called Breaking Through Limitations because so Get many those people. Out of here. Yeah, so I mean, look, you can't live impossible, but be bumping <laughs> into the glass ceiling all the time. And so, like, I had this thought process: like, man, there's some limitations that people bump into all the time. And so, we had to start with the biggest limitation that most people bump into. And you've already read the title, so you know what it is: it's identity. And you might have, and if I had just asked you that, a lot of people might have answered something differently. But so many people are just bumping into their identity and they don't even know it. And you don't realize that's the problem. And the answer is not uh, get a fake ID. Right. Right. Because yeah. that's what people that you think, uh, you know, I, I have friends who they had an ID that was not theirs so right. that they could get access to something that they should not have had, ac- had access to. That's what an I- identity does for you. It unlocks certain things. Right. Exactly. Well, you know, speaking of an unlock for an identity, G, Garrett will send me reels. We, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're much like many people on social media and sending things back and forth. And he sent me this reel the other day that I absolutely loved. So it's Young Tiger Woods. It's 1996. He's been interviewed before at, his first professional he, tournament. He's played, he's played the opening day of his first professional tournament. And Curtis Strange, who's a professional golfer as well, is interviewing him and goes, hey, like, what would be a successful, you know, successful tournament for you? And Tiger's like, yeah, to you know, to win, and he's like, it, 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 I'm I'm summarizing because they go back and forth quite a bit, and and you watch as Curtis Strange keeps trying to talk him down and go like, mm, come on, man, like maybe just you know making the cut, like are you sure you want to say that, like hey, that's actually kind of he arrogant. quote Tiger quotes his father, and you know second place is first loser, yeah, and Curtis Strange says, you know second place that's is right. is pretty good though, yeah, you, you know you on get the, paid pretty well the, for second, tour. third, fourth, and yeah. by the way, if you know. PJ history. It's it was I think it was nineteen ninety four. Curtis Strange is second in the US Open. Right. right. He has Curtis Strange actually had a lot of second place finishes. Oh, okay. And so he's impressioning and or imprinting his own experience on it. Exactly. Tiger. So you so so what you see is you see two conflicting identities. You see a guy who's never got there and is saying, like, but you know, but it's still really good. Well, he's actually really smug at the end of the end of the interview. Tiger Woods is like really polite and is like, Hey, I just want to win. I believe I'm gonna win. I came here to win. Right. That's the only if I'm coming into a tournament, I wouldn't enroll in a tournament if I didn't think I could win. Yeah. And that's and exactly he's also what he had says. a career so far of one junior PGA, one amateur of the year. Like he's won Tiger has won everything coming into this. Like he's the most standout all star of, you know, amateur golfers coming into this. And at the end of the interview, Curtis Strange basically, in response to Tiger, politely just swallowing Curtis's negativity, says, okay, but I just, I'm here to win. I want to win. That's what I want to do. And Curtis Strange is just like, well, you'll learn. Right. Yeah, that's how the, that's how the clip finished. And I love that. And he, that. Was, he was player of the year that year. 
Yeah, Tiger, not Curtis. Yeah. Right. And I, I just love that because that is literally, that's what's going on in a lot of people's heads all day is mm -hmm. they've got their Curtis Strange that's like, you know, you, you're not you just, it's okay. Like, you're not that good. You don't, you shouldn't expect that. And yeah. then you've got, you've got that tiger voice. Right. And that's just you in, internally, but you, and not to mention all the external noise that you got coming at you. So that, that is what we're going to get into because when you know who you are, you know, who you're called to serve, like what precedes a uh, purpose is identity. Well, what would have been a limiting belief for tiger? Tiger didn't have any, what would have been a limiting belief for tiger is if he went into it and is like, I don't think I can win. I'll just, right see how good I can do. Yeah, it's great that I'm here. Like this is this that's the real prize. And a lot of people will say that to themselves mm -hmm. because they're trying to save themselves the pain mm -hmm. of well, well if I fail and I tried to win, then I would feel like I'm not good enough. Yeah. That's exactly that's right. That's scary for people. Yeah, inadequacy. It's one of but people's greatest fears. It, on the other side of that, you have Jim Rohn, feedback is the breakfast of champions. A guy who uh, a champion who aspires to win and loses and he says, "I know what I need to improve." Right. Right, and that's that was Tiger's response to any time he didn't win. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, G, you have a little bit of experience. It wasn't exactly Curtis Strange, and it wasn't the 1996 <laughs> PGA Tour, but you know, no, Curtis you Strange was a lot nicer to Tiger than, uh, <laughs> yeah. than some of my voices were to me. Yeah. Um, you're referencing when I. This is, I mean, really, it's a defining moment, pivotal story in my own life, of when I was beginning to go through SEAL training. Instead, honestly, it started in boot camp, and I'll just summarize. I won't hit all the. I won't like retell the story. I'll just summarize. From boot camp onwards all the way into um, pre-buds, which is basically like an athletic training program to prime you and get you ready for SEAL training. Through all of this, I got nothing but discouragement from people. I had a roommate who told me every single day, you have no chance here. And like that, that's just one of the things that I consistently heard. I had instructors. I had other people who would just try to make it a point of like, what are you doing here? Why do you think you belong here? Mm. And... The point, the 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 unfortunate truth is, um, they had a point. Yeah, I was in the bottom third of the class physically, right? I th as you as we talk about, thought I was an athlete till I met one. Yeah, I thought I was. You know, when I ran my PST, my screening test to get into the Navy, I was faster than everyone else at the screener. Right, I ran the best test of anybody that day. Right. And, you know, of my small pool of candidates yeah. trying to go, I was, I got first place. Feeling confident. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, the man. But then got there to training and realized I'm not that great. Yeah. And so there was validity to what they were saying. You're not good enough. You don't belong here. But here was my response to them. And uh, I verbalized this response once, maybe twice. Most of the time, I just kept it in. But what I would, my response to them and how I could keep my emotional composure and really maintain my sense of confidence, my sense of identity, because my internal response to them is your points are valid, right? That may be true, but there's another truth. Not, and this isn't like a my truth situation, right? There's another truth that they don't see. Mm -hmm. I have had a father who has prepared me, who has spoken to me. And you know what? You guys, what you're saying is true about my physical ability. But this is not the Olympics. Right. Right. And there's a man who knows me a lot better than you do. And he sees more in me than you. So I'm going to listen to him and not you. You're not my coach. Right. And so essentially what I was saying in, in the midst of this, these are people who have credibility. And, and the same way we talked about uh, mentor, mentors, heroes, mm -hmm. and teachers, um, th there's some negative voices that may be able, like, if you receive negative feedback from your coach, you should listen to that. Right. When you receive negative feedback from the audience, I just saw this hilarious video. I didn't know the, the tennis player. Um, he was a S South American tennis player just from his accent. And uh, he turned around and yells back at the audience because it's Ben Stiller. <laughs> It's Ben Stiller in the oh, audience, really? and he says, "Are you very good at tennis?" And and like they, they were showing, they had Ben Stiller's faces. He's, he's like shocked. He's like, "No." He's like, "Then why are you telling me how to play tennis? <laughs> I don't tell you how to act." <laughs> That's awesome. Like this dude was was pissed. <laughs> That's so awesome, <laughs> right? And so there's certain voices that you should listen to, right. and you shouldn't listen to. And so these guys had a point, but that's not the voice that I was listening to. I knew that my, my father's voice, and I'm speaking not just my natural father, but supernatural father, God, what they've said about me is more important than what you're saying. Mm. Now, really catch that because we're going to reference that a lot. I'll be honest. This episode took a little bit of a left turn because uh, I we spent a few hours prepping. We, for this we spent longer than planned prepping for this, um, and I'm really excited to share it with you guys. We're going to get into the things that hold people back, obviously, and breaking through the limitations. So just, just to summarize that story, yes, you have to really because we'll come back to this. 
two things were being said at the same time, mm -hmm. right? I'm the one in the middle of the conversation. The people, my accusers, don't hear the other side of the conversation. I'm the one hearing both sides. Right. I'm hearing my accusers. I'm hearing my father. Garrett had to determine which is true. Exactly. Now, and that, you know, the thing is, though, because we've talked about this, you were giving your absolute best. <laughs> like, they, like, there was no, like, oh, I didn't try hard. You're yeah. giving everything you got, and it's like your bottom third of the class. Yeah. And it's like, okay. So, like, anecdote, not even, it's not even anecdotal. There was hard truth to what, the, to yeah. what they were saying. And, that, and, and so, so you could easily sit there and be like, you know what? Everything I thought was wrong, but you said, no, these guys don't really know me. Yep. Right. And so, so catch that because we're going to come back to that because how I saw this going is I've, I've bumped into identity. And, and I essentially had to, because what they were saying is true in the moment. I was saying, right, because pre-buds, which is a workout, is not buds. Mm -hmm. And so they're saying, based upon your physical performance, you're not good enough. Yeah. And I had to say, I believe something else. We'll see. Right. Exactly. Now, and, and that led to what we want to do here today is because I've, I've dealt with identity. I bumped into limiting beliefs. And so we want to go into some of those, how to change them, what the most common ones are. And we're going to do that. Uh, I just think it's going to be a lot different than uh, how I thought it was going to go. It's definitely going to be different than that. And it might be different than some, how some of y'all thought it was going to go. So, gee, I guess the first thing is, I mean, because what is a limiting belief, right? Like what, that term is known, but what yeah, is it? So we, as we like to do on this show, we set our own definition for it. And a limiting belief is a thought. And so just understand that a limiting belief is just a thought. Mm -hmm. That thoughts can be dangerous, thoughts can be powerful. Limiting belief is a thought that terminates potential. Right. Now think you, about that. You have allowed a thought yes. into your life. You've allowed a thought into your mind, into your being, that you had potential. It is destroyed mm -hmm. based upon this thought that you've allowed. Now, a lot of people where they will, that they can relate to this, it's, you'll hear people say things like imposter st syndrome or an inferiority, you know, a complex. And so how this will show up is that people will actually have success, but they'll still, they'll end up sabotaging themselves or talking themselves down all the time. Limiting beliefs, al beliefs allow us to be comfortable. Right. Right. If I'm capable, if I'm capable, let's just use it like a really simple example. If I'm capable of, you know, high jump, l Olympic event, if I'm capable of a, six and a half foot high jump mm -hmm. but through my limiting belief i say i oh, mean i'm really only capable of five that puts a lot less requirement and responsibility on me right man wants to avoid responsibility don't hold me responsible for six foot six that's hard right it would require me to train a lot give the best give my best on a single day and the wind is right and i'll hit six six i don't want to know that Limiting belief says I'm only responsible for jumping five feet. Yeah, but but I think a lot of people that have those limiting beliefs, they'll they'll explain away their own successes and they'll they'll over attribute for other people. So like, and, and they'll limit themselves in this way. They'll say things like, you know, Garrett's man, Garrett's like really got a lot of authority, or he's he's you know he's pretty strong and fearless. That's he, that's just the way he was born. I'm not like that. Like that that is a limiting belief right there of like inferiority. So even whenever, let's say you do things that are brave. Well, I'm not that's like not, him. That's not what Scripture says. Right. It's not. Second Timothy 1, sin, 1 7 says, I have not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. Is that true for you? Right. Because it's true for me. Right. Well, yeah, but that's exactly it. And that, that's the whole point of like, of you have to decide. So it, it's interesting that people, because we all have these beliefs and these different things that are going around in our head. So I guess the question is like, how are these formed? Like, where do you, where do you start to get a, a belief formed? So I, we were looking at this. I mean, if you look from the very young time when you're born, you're, you're pretty much a blank slate apart from the unique 1% that God makes you with, right? And so you have all these different experiences and people that come into your life and as you grow up, you basically what ends up happening, and we still see this nowadays, the way this works nowadays is, you know, we have a presidential debate and then everybody spends weeks arguing about what it meant, right? What are they doing? They're putting a, they're defining, they're, they're putting a definition and a meaning on it so that they can impact beliefs, right? And then what you believe about the candidate or whatever it may be. We do this with sports. We do this with all. It, they're giving meaning to it. Here's what we exactly. said. Here's what that means. Right. And we do this all the time. And that's how you, you form. That's how people form their identity by default. You're going to have people around you, mainly your parents and your family when you're young, and they're going to be inputting their, their thoughts into you. They're going to be sharing their own ways of thinking, their views on things. And you're going to be taking those things on. And that's going to shape the meaning uh, that you give to things. And then from that meaning that you give them, it's going to create beliefs about yourself, 
which then forms your identity. And it's all happening automatically, right? And, and if you're lucky, I mean, Garrett, one, I say to people all the time, one of the things that's so exceptional about you is your identity, which is why you're so strong on purpose as well. Is And you talk about it all the time, the infinite potential unlock. You had it from a young age. You had parents that spoke into you and told you who you were. If, if I had let my experiences through SEAL training form my identity... Wouldn't have a very strong identity. No, you probably would have quit, and you'd be sitting there going, "Like, man, I thought." Well, because they they make you fail a lot, right? And and again, I'd, I I started to do well after buds, but um, the only thing I was really good at in buds was the obstacle course. Everything I was I was middle of the road at swimming. I was terrible at running, right? I had you know, everyone's got events that they're good at, events that they're bad at, and the the ones that I was good at, which was like l- logs. And obstacle course, I focused on that. I'm mm-hmm. like, man, this see, look, this is where I shine. I know I got it. Right. Which is an amazing thing. But see, it's so- the same as imagine if you're playing in a football game and you're a wide receiver and you catch half of the the passes that right. are thrown to you. You dropped half of you that you would like better than that. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For but, sure. but you catch half and you drop half. And you could say you had a good game or a terrible game. Right. The facts wouldn't change, right? But the meaning you give them would change, right? right? This is like story, like we've talked about before, where if if it's a good game, it's like, man, those passes that I caught, those were the good ones. I scored on those mm-hmm. passes. Like, those were the ones that mattered. Okay, I dropped a few. I shouldn't have dropped those, but we overcame that, right? Right. That's a good story of the drop passes. Or you can say, man, we lost the game because I dropped these passes. Right. It's the meaning that you give to it. So, so the logical conclusion based on what we said that you have these experiences that pass through these filters where you give them meaning that then create your beliefs that then form your identity. The, the obvious thing would be like, well, I just need to change what my beliefs are. Like you said, okay, I had, I dropped half the passes. Was that a good game or a bad game? Well, I'm just going to keep telling myself it's a good game and that's what it is, right? That's how you change and, beliefs, and, right, G? Well, <laughs> and it's also disassociating some of these external things or these temporal things from your identity right statistically like you know who defines what a good football player is it's not me right there's there's coaches and scouts and they say wide receivers who catch this many passes that's a good player right right and so it wasn't like i could have my own story of how i feel about myself but they're going to define what makes a good football player not me but that doesn't define who I am as a person. Right. And we're going to get more into that. But I was, as I was saying, like the question that I was saying was like, well, how do we change these limiting beliefs? And so I posed that to you and we looked at all this and I asked you, I said, gee, so how do you change these limiting beliefs? And I was expecting you to give an analogy like the football and just say, well, you got to just keep encouraging yourself that you're, that, that you yeah, have a good game. You don't. Right. <laughs> you, you, don't, you, you don't, you're not going to improve a limiting belief. You have to erase it. Right. Okay. Well, let's let's get into that, G. Um, This is where we took the hard left turn, and I'm excited to take you guys with me. Underneath all of that, because I we were going back and forth about this for a while. uh, This is well. This is also like you and I've had this conversation before, and there's there's voices or there's phrases that I think really embody some of the world's mindset. And one of those, some of those phrases are, you know, I would do that if I was more disciplined. Right. Right. Or if I would, I just wish I was more disciplined, then I'd be that way. That's the same thing as people saying, well, I'll, I'll tithe when God gives me more money. Right. Right. You're the one, you're the one that's got to change. And then everything around you is going to change. When you decide, like you, you have the ability to choose when you choose to be disciplined, that's when you're going to grow in discipline, not God give it to me. Right. And then I'll be different. This is a uh, elementary level of who you are as a, like who you are as a person. In the beginning, everything has to be given to you. Mm-hmm. Right? It's a miracle when a 1-month-old baby is living because if no one helped it, it would die. Yeah. Right? But that's not where we we start there. We we don't stay there. Right. You've got to grow into okay, now I have the ability to choose, I have the ability to think. And so you've got to determine in your life now like you you learn how to choose food as you get older. As you mature, you've really got to learn how to choose truth. Right. What is that's good? What are the things that who I am is based off of? Yes. And that is the, and so that's what Garrett said that kind of took the hard left in my mind because when I said like how do you change a belief, I was thinking like, okay, you know, think about what you're well, again, let's I'm I'm just trying to help form this for for the audience. You said in 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 the world's version of where an identity comes from, it starts with your experiences. Right. And so that the way to break that down would be to ask this question, are my experiences a reflection of truth? Right. Right. So if, if I if I fail, does that mean I'm a failure? Right. 
right? Do my experiences reflect truth? Right. And so that like that opens up a whole world of questions. It really does. Which really comes down to what is true. Yes. And so if you're going to say that something is true based upon like I've seen it or I felt this way about it, that's a dangerous road to go down when your filter for truth is determined by I, I feel good about it. Right. Well, exactly. And, and that so most people's default ends up being that where they end up with identity is it was three things is you said that the, the world's identity is based on either what you possess, mm-hmm. the perception of you or what you've achieved. That's that's yeah, that's most people's false identities. Yeah. Right. I, I'm I'm a good person. I'm a strong person. I'm a whatever I want to be based upon what I possess, what people think about think about me, or what my achievements have been. Yeah, exactly. And so so here's the thing: if you're so now the whole thought process of how you change your limiting belief would be like, well, you know, I've got to change the way I think about what I've achieved, what I've what my perception is, or what I possess. That would be kind of a logical thought process. But here's the problem: you're still based on a logic that's not that's not based on truth because. What you know, what you possess now, maybe ten years from now, it's not worth you know. It's not considered cool anymore. So you got to change again. Maybe what what people perceive you could change overnight. Your achievements could all be worthless or be wiped out, right? Let me make a golf analogy. All right, um, this would be like, you know, a, a good golfer, right? Like there's a determination for par. Yeah. Par is what you're trying to shoot. If you're, you know, and honestly, people, a lot of people would say like a good, good golfer is just like plus six handicap, which means you shoot six strokes over par. Like that's a pretty good golfer. Right. But par is, is neutral, right? That's what you're trying to do. If you're above that, if you're better than par, you're really good. If you're um, over par, then you are less than par. Like literally the definition of par is this is what it should right. be. This is what you're, you're shooting for. So if I shoot a, you know, over par, if I shoot a 90, when I'm trying to shoot a 72, does that mean I just need to you know, well, that's good for me. Right. Right. I think a lot of people would think uh, like the, the what we're talking about could come across like maybe just lower your expectations. Yeah. Right. And that that's not what it is. You've also got to understand, even if I can only shoot 90 at golf like that, that maybe that's who I am as a golfer, but it's not who I am as a man. And right. so you've got to separate mm. some of these worldly things, some of these temporal things and, and a lot more serious than golf. What about how much money you make? Right. Right. Is how much money you make is how much you can bench. Like, is that who you are as a man? Right. Right. What do you base your identity off of? Right. And well, for a lot of people, that is what it's based off of. One of my favorite questions is like, you know, whenever someone says like, Hey, who are you? They'll start telling you about like, well, here's my job and here's how many kids I have and here's where I'm married. But like, we said that the question of identity is what do you bring into any room? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a troublesome one, right? Because that, that means that it's all the time consistent everywhere. And actually I don't, I don't see a lot of people that answer that question well. And so that's wherever we get into this. And that's wherever you threw the whole thing out, because you talked about when you build your identity on God, now it's, you know, you're answering the question and because the question of identity is what do I say is true? That's why we gave that example of buds. You had people like with factual proof saying you are the, one of the worst people here. Mm -hmm. And you're saying, yeah, you don't know me. And what, remember, a limiting belief is a thought yes. that terminates potential. Right. Right. And so I'm saying, you know what? Maybe I suck right now. Right. But I'm capable of more. I have potential to be more. And I'm going to grow and I'm going to pursue that. And you've got to, it's just like when you're a kid and you have a good dad who, like, you're not good at baseball, but your dad's like, you know what, son? You'll get better. I'll help you. Right. right? It just, you know, when your son is six and he can't hardly hit a baseball off a tee. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Is, right. that, is he always going to be there? No. Right. Right. And a good father is going to say, son, I'll help you grow in this. Yeah. Trust. You can't see it. You're pissed right now. <laughs> yeah. You, you just want to throw the bat on the ground. But I promise you'll get there. This is what you're capable of. You speak into your son. You can do this. I, I know what you're capable of. I can see more than you can in right. this regard. Right. And in the same way, God has set, he has told us, here's some of the things that you are. There's unique things about all of us. Some of us are seven feet tall. Some of us are five feet tall. Some of us can jump. Some of us can't. Some of us uh, can sing really well. Some of us can't. There's all kinds of unique things. But the, the core of my identity is built upon the things that my father, my heavenly father said, this is who you are. Right. So talk us through what that like what that looks like, because I think you embody that so well about being a guy who can walk into a situation and and, because you also don't view yourself like that. You view other people. Well, here's the here's the like because you you can get stuck in like, man, these things don't line up. Uh, God said, I have a spirit of power, love and a sound mind. Um, I'm retarded. I'm mad at people. And uh, I'm not very like strong at anything. Like, I don't see how there's major conflict in this area. Right. And I'm just like over 
uh, I'm oversimplifying. Like basically, like you you feel like you're the opposite of what the Word of God says. Right? Doesn't mean the Word of God is wrong. Right. That's the decision you have to make. I can't make that decision for you. You have to decide. Like this is what I've decided. Scripture is the authority in my life. We talked about this a few months ago uh, in relation to the the levels of progressing in your relationship with God. You've got to determine that God's word, God's scripture is the number one authority in my life. So I can look at any situation where whether it's the world is saying it to me, Satan's trying to whisper doubt and shame to me, I can say, this is what my father said. You're wrong, hmm. right? And until you put scripture in that place in your life, and also that... This is the good side of putting scripture in that place. Scripture, when you make scripture the authority in your life, it will also require you to change a lot. Yeah. Right? God wants to change us. And that that you may think like God just wants you to be happy. You've misunderstood the gospel. God started his promise with people by circumcising them. Right? <laughs> yeah. It's a very uncomfortable situation where he says, I'm gonna change you. You're gonna look different than the rest of my pe- than the rest of the people on the earth. Yeah. Right. So God wants us to change. But you've got to decide scripture is the authority in my life, and this is who I am. So that when I face doubt, when I face other voices, whether it's, you know, people in my buds class, people in my business, whatever it is, that they would say, That's a, you you look like this, you're this thing. That's not true. This is true. This is what my father says. Right. Until you submit your life to scripture in that way, you'll always be lost in the voices. Like basically your identity will be built on whoever is yelling at you the loudest. And, and one of the things that we talked about when you're doing this, submitting your, your life to scripture like that, it, it is a process, right? And it's, it's not like it's something that you just go, oh, well, that's what I got to do. So I'm going to strain it out. And like, you know, because you can be the person that's there shouting scriptural affirmations in the mirror, you know, at yourself to try and make yourself change. Because it, it, well, it requires humility to say, okay, God said, God's word says that I have power, love, and a sound mind. I don't see any of that in myself. Right. And so that means if, if it's literally not there, but God says it's in you, it means you have to grow. Right. The same, Very like, like you, you're, you're telling your son, son, you can do this. And he's like, I can't. I just, you know, whacked the tee 20 times in a mm-hmm. row. I can't hit the ball. I don't like baseball. Hmm. Right. You're saying, I know you're capable of. You, you, God sees more in you. Your father, a father sees more in his son than he sees in himself when he's young and immature. And so you've got to decide, you know what? I trust my, I trust my father more than I trust myself. Right. So, so here's the, here was the thing that really shifted for me when we were talking about this. It's not just that you're saying like, Hey, I've had these experiences or I've got these limiting beliefs and I really would like to change them. It's actually looking at the whole source of what you're the authority of scripture is just what destroys the limiting beliefs. It doesn't, you can't just say like God's God's uh, word says I have power, love and a sound mind. So I'm smart. Right. It doesn't work that way. Right. Right. But he's saying, here's what's in you. Right. Right. And so when you'll submit to that, you'll remove the limiting belief, a thought that terminates potential. Let's get those things out of the way. Now we can have some humility, right? Because God says he loves me. I'm his son, whether I'm talented or not. I'm not trying to work to get God to love me. Right. And he says I'm capable. We've removed the limiting beliefs. Now I I can move forward and grow and I'm going to grow into what God says that I am. And so even though people doubt me, discourage me, that doesn't really matter because I'm not trying, I don't need them to tell me who I am. God already told me who I am. Yes. I don't need anyone else's love. I already have God's love and I'm not even doing this for myself. I'm doing this because God has a plan for my life and I'm going to live up to it and mature into it. So discouragement, negative voices have zero impact on you. Right. Now, and, and you say that as a guy who lives that out, which I absolutely love. This is not theoretical. But I think for most people, they'll, they'll nurse, hearse, and recurse, or no, nurse, curse, and rehearse their failures in their head over and over again. And what they never ask themselves, the question is like, hey, who's, who's, who are you, like, what truth are you basing this on? Mm-hmm. Because in order for those things to be your identity, the truth would have to be that, you, that your achievements are what defines you. And that, to me, is the real unlock. You've got to be okay with the, like... People told me I was prideful and arrogant when I said I'm going to go through SEAL training. Right? Right. I know I'm going to do this. People said, you're prideful, you're arrogant. People may call you delusional, mm-hmm. right? Just make sure your delusion is based upon the Word of God and you'll be okay. Right. Your so, delusion should not be based upon, well, here's what I want to be. Mm-hmm. Here's, who, what, here's the way I think things should work, right? That is a negative form of delusion. Remember, I've talked about this before. The difference between, uh, between resilience and delusion is is what it's based upon, what the truth is, right? When your resilience is based upon who God says you are, it's not delusion, Mm -hmm. right? People may not see it in you. They don't have to. It's not a requirement, 
right? I'm not working. My, my desire is to please God, not to please man. Yeah. Now, I, I think people would really love for this to just be something super simple, G, that we just give you a five-step technique and you reverse your, you know, everything changes oh, for it, you. This is as simple as it gets. It's just very hard. Exactly. So base your life on the Word of God. Base who, who you are is based upon what the Word of God says. Yeah. The, the problems you have in your life is because you don't do that. Right. So what, what does the process of, of growing into that, uh, you know, because we talked about like your beliefs can change, but transformation takes time. Okay, what, what does that process look like? Because I, I think the analogy that you used of a player playing baseball, because I mean, I have my son's five. We were out hitting balls today mm -hmm. and it's this, you're 100 percent accurate. I'm like, hey, you, you know, you can do this. There's some there's some things that we got to work on here. You know, I, you know, hands, you're keeping your eye on the ball, all that basic stuff that we all know from baseball. And that's and that, that's really on, on him. Right. Right. He yes. has to trust you. Right. He has to trust you that when you say, son, you can do this. And then he has to do the work of actually practicing, actually learning. Right. Do what you hey, keep your eye on the ball, all the little tips for hitting a baseball. Mm -hmm. He has to actually do that part. So there's list, there's trusting God. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, action based faith. Yes. I mean, good. sorry, faith based action. Yeah. Right. Now that I trust you, I will act upon that. Mm. And that's where a lot of people break down yes. in their identity. Like, man, like I believe in God and all that stuff, but I got no money in my bank account. I believe in God and all that stuff, but um, I'm still sick. Mm -hmm. Right. Whatever it is, you when you say it's not working, the, the whole equation uh, of our relationship with God is him maturing us through him, through us trusting him. Saying, God, your way, I'm going to trust you regardless of what happens, mm. right? That's when you put God in a position of like, God, I'll trust you if you make me successful. I'll right. trust you if you heal me. You're not going to see what you want to see out of God. Mm. And I think that that's such a common thing. Like, like, I mean, that's what shipwrecked me back in the day was I was like believing God for miracles. When I didn't see him, I was like, well, this stuff must not be true. You know, completely missing the, the, the points of maturity. And, and like you said, learn to trust in God. What I wanted was I wanted a magic genie. I wanted to be able to kind of like say the right scriptures and strain out enough faith that I could just go around and heal whoever I wanted. Yeah, there there is no magic incantation. It's right. just trust. Yeah, know what His Word says and trust Him. Yeah, and there's a risk involved in that, isn't that? In there's a there's a huge risk. That's the part of right in, in the parable of the talents. The one talent servant, he 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 did nothing with it because he said, "Master, I was afraid. I knew you to be a hard man, so I hid it in the ground." Right, right. Out of fear, it comes untapped potential. Right. And like, if you want to like, because again, this is about getting rid of getting rid of limiting beliefs. Limiting beliefs keep you from your potential. Mm -hmm. If you want to get rid of limiting beliefs, right, you've got to have the thing that overcomes all limiting beliefs: the truth of the Word of God. Yeah. So, at what point do you think someone really gets to know, like, and understand who they are? You know, because like you have such a solid. Like, I, I reference your intro as one of the best intros I've ever heard. I was this before Garrett and I were really close, and we were in a mastermind, and they said like, "Who are you?" And Garrett was like, "I'm a I'm a strategic thinker, chaos navigator, and odds defier." And because of that, and you started well, listing what you same, do. It was it's amazing. the same as like David uh, in the Bible. Uh, you know, this isn't like overly, de overly described, it's implied, but David was probably feeling pretty unloved by his family, right? He was the last son out in the fields, yeah. right? Like he didn't have, you know, mommy there and he didn't have his father to, to help. He's just out taking care of the sheep. So mm -hmm. it was just him and God. Um, and so out of that, like he had to learn to rely on God, learn to trust in God, but also what he started to do was develop himself. Yeah. Right. And because he felt loved by God, he could really see what his actual skills are. You getting down to like the, the, what Pastor Keith calls your unique fingerprint, the 1%, the thing that's unique to you, that comes from the maturity of your identity. Mm. Right. Scripture is the things that are common to all of us. Right. You've got to grow and mature to see the things that are not common to everybody, the things that are unique to you. Yeah. So are there specific scriptures or if somebody's out there and they're like, man, I have been basing my identity on what I've achieved, what people have said about me, what I possess, you know, like their perception of me. Like, where would you, where would you direct someone and say, like, look, here's where, you, like, okay, you understand this now. How do I start? What do you, what do you mean? Like, w would you direct them to read certain scriptures or is there something that they, because like, I think people, like some people will be like, man, I need to know what to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, for like, there's a there's a lot of unique scriptures on who you are and identity. But I would start honestly, like, with Psalms and Proverbs. Mm -hmm. Read from the man, right? Proverbs, wisest man. Uh, Psalms, David, the man who the Bible says had a heart like was after God's own heart. 
read from someone who had such a powerful identity. My favorite identity characters in the Bible are David and Joseph. Right. Right. I love Abraham for faith and for trusting in God. But David and Joseph were men who knew who they were. Mm -hmm. They went through really difficult seasons, even being alone in those seasons, and they held on to who God says that they were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. So it's a matter of just getting into the Word, getting to know God, getting to know what He says, and, and begin yeah, to build and then, that faith. And then in the New Testament, especially in um, in the epistles, right, you're going to get scriptures like 2 Timothy 1.7, right, right, that are very, like, this is who you are, yeah, right? God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. But that's all, I mean, that's all of scripture. Scripture is our, un, is our opportunity to understand God, to know who God is, and consequently know who we are. Right, and when you're doing that, now you're interpreting what goes on around you way differently, right? Like you're changing it to be a filter that's based on God's truth, so it's like, you know, if you have a conflict, I mean, you gave the example of somebody who might have like business failures or whatever it may be, that, that doesn't become who you are. Yeah, it doesn't, it won't change everything in a moment, right? Right. But it changes your understanding of the world, so it allows you to grow. Again, it's limiting beliefs are a thought that terminates potential. When you're, when you do not have a God-based identity, you're not going to be able to grow into who God says you are. But the thing is, it takes time, mm. right? If you are a business owner who's just been a total knucklehead in your business, your people don't trust you, you make poor decisions, you don't show up on time, all those things. You don't like go into a meeting the next day with your team and be like, guys, look, I have a God identity now. So like everything's better. Right. You guys should just trust me and do what I say. And we're going to win now. Yeah. Right. Like nothing's changed except your beliefs have changed. Right. Right. But you have to transform and transformation is a process. Right. Right. So you're like, you're going to mm. by humility. Right. Now you'll learn like, okay, uh, like this is who God says I am, but I'm being a total ding dong. So I got to learn some things. I got to change the way that I am, but this is who I can be. Mm. Right. So it doesn't like you're stuck if you're like, well, I've made bad choices. So I'm just I guess I'm just destined to fail a business. No, I'm not. Right. This is who God says I am. I just need to grow. Mm. You know, what's so interesting about that that I hadn't really thought about before. One of my favorite quotes that Pastor Josh says about you is that he says that you knew who you were before everybody else did. And that was one of the reasons why when people would try and push you into whatever they want to say about you, you were just like, yeah, no, I'm not. And, and I, I love that quote about you, but like, and I think a lot of people see that in you and will, will admire that about at, you. At a young age, I realized the power of potential. Right. And I like where people didn't see it in me, I knew that didn't matter. Right. Right. It's what, it's one of the, uh, we, I've been naming some of them lately, but like some of the most influential quotes in my life, probably number one is Henry Ford's, whether you think mm -hmm. you can or you think you can't, you're right. And so it didn't say if other people think you can't, they're right. Right. It said if you think you can or think you can't, you're right. And so what, like to me as a young person, I read that and I'm like, doesn't matter what other people say. Right. You don't think I can do it? Watch this. Right. And there was definitely some of like God's unique 1% in you. I think I knowing your strengths and just being around you as much as I am, I know that there's things that are unique to you that people should not try and be like, oh, I want that. It's like, no, that's God given. But identity... I was thinking about different people in the Bible. I think what trips people up is that people have this blueprint in their head that they want to have their identity shaped and formed by a certain age. And if they don't feel like they have that, because you said it's a transformation process. Well, what does that say? Some processes take longer than others. Man, Mo the, Moses didn't know until he was much older. So much of my, I, like the identity I have today is about how I respond to things and how I'm going to live. Right. There's, there's parts of me that I'm still saying, like, God, reveal this. Mm. God, show me this. God, I see this. Do you see this? Is this who I can be? This is who I believe I can be, right? And I haven't walked into those things right. yet, right? When you're, when you're 10 years old and dream of playing in the MLB, right, like, you don't know yet. Mm -hmm. I, I dream of that. Maybe it, maybe it is to be. Maybe it's not. And if it's not and I trust in God, then it's not because that's not the plan that he has for me and there's something else that he wants me to do that's better, mm -hmm. right? And so there's th there's dreams that I have today. My identity is not based upon did I accomplish every little dream that I had. My identity is based upon here's who God says I am and here I, here's how I'm going to act in the world, right? And so God's not saying like, man, if you don't make this much money or do this or accomplish these things, like you didn't accomplish the purposes that I have for you. Right. God is sovereign. Man is responsible, which means... All I have to do is if I'll just not have limiting beliefs, if I'll just not be afraid, right? We could, we talk about this every Saturday at Mighty Man. What's the thing that keeps you from your destiny? Fear, right? So I need to not be afraid. I need to not doubt God and just do the be, be a good steward, do the best I can with what God's given me, and I'm going to win, and God's going to be happy with me, mm. right? And so I'm not like, to if you define win, like, man, I'm only a good person if I, you know, win a USPGA tournament, 
right? That you're putting yourself in a pretty narrow box of you're right. a good person. That may not be God's plan for your life. To Garrett's definition of I'm a good person is I did all that, I, like I ran my race. I did all that I could mm-hmm. with what God gave me. I lived according to his word. I did my best to listen to the Holy Spirit and and exemplify fruit of the Spirit, love people well, lead people to Christ, right? I've got the things that scripture says to do and with whatever God leaves me and there's not direct scripture on, I'm just going to run as hard as I can and offer the best fruit I can to God. Hmm. I love that, man. And that's such a mature way to look at it. And when you talk about it, truth, I mean, what's not going to change? God's word, right? God is not going to change. So who he says you are is not going to change regardless of all those other things. And I think so often we fall into that, what you said about like, oh, if I don't make to the USPG, I mean, I see, I work a lot with pro athletes and you see the guys, I'm sure you've seen it with the SEAL teams, guys get out of the teams where they get out of the sport they play. They don't really know, they don't know who they are because everything that they were tied up in was people being like, dude, you play all oh, that, that, that hit you made last week or whatever it is. That was amazing. And that, that becomes who they are. They don't know how to cope. And I think that's a lot of people. It's like they've had one thing in their head for the whole time. They've never asked themselves, like, hey, what is this based on? What's the truth? Like, what do I say is true? What has to be true here for the way that I'm, I'm going on? And so uh, the, the whole point in sharing this, guys, is we just we really wanted you guys. Like I said, I was looking at this like, hey, we can talk about some common limiting beliefs. But it wasn't just the limiting beliefs and how to change them. It was actually building a whole new foundation that erases those beliefs. And when it's based on God's word, that is how you will grow to the most confident because that's when you can be the guy that's like setting up the chairs or he's the he's the janitor at NASA and he's like, we put people on the moon. Right? Why? Because I'm playing the role that I'm supposed to play. I don't have to be Neil Armstrong. And that that's like no one wants to say, hey, I'm the janitor. But realistically, like God makes people for all different roles. You can either just live your life mad at God for him not making you whatever it is that you wanted to be. Right. Or you can say, God, what position do you want me to play? Right? Like I love like middle school and high school football because there's a lot like you don't see that in college but in high school it's like okay look um i need you to play linebacker right you're a wide receiver i need you to play linebacker right now okay right just go hit somebody right all right yeah i can do that just play your part right like that's that's really our life with god god i'm just gonna do what you need me to do right and that's a really humble place last thing g before we wrap up here you, you shared something really good when we were prepping about, and you've touched on it numerous times about 2 Timothy 1.7, about how about Peter, or sorry, Paul reminding Timothy, like, look, this is what God says you are, is that you have this spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Can you just finish it up? Because I think that's something that's so useful for people, because he's saying, look, God's not giving you a spirit of fear. This fear that you're feeling is not who you really are. This is who you really are. Yeah, if you're feeling fear, it's not from God, mm-hmm. right? This is Paul reminding Timothy, if you have fear in your life, it's not from God. I have given you a spirit. He describes these three things of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And I I think it's so interesting and and so prescriptive that even in this verse, he says power before love. Scripture is all about love, says that God is love. Without love, you miss the entire gospel. But even before that, he says power, like I've made you strong. If you look at the journey of who God is in the Bible, God shows you how strong he is. And then Christ shows us how much he loves us, Mm. right? This is like God saying, I'm powerful and I love you and you have a sound mind. These three things to me, power, love, and a sound mind, they overcome any inferiority complex. They overcome any limiting belief that you can have. Like God has made me all of these things. Like I'm, I'm powerful or if I don't feel powerful, it means I'm capable of it. I can grow into it. I am like, God gave me a spirit of love. I'm not going to make it about me, right? If you want to like get over any drama you have in your life, just start loving other people, love Mm -hmm. other people. Well, you want, you'll quit worrying about yourself, right? When you're worrying about yourself, you're not loving other people. Well, or you might say, man, I just don't have what I don't have the skills. I don't have the hand eye coordinate, whatever it is. A sound mind, God, a sound mind, like the definition of that is God saying, like, I gave you the mind that you need. Mm. So you have everything that you need to be who God's created you to be. Let your identity be based off that. 